All right, hello everyone, this is Sean. And today I'm here to tell you about our recent work on applying forensics to trace back data poisoning attack in deep neural networks. This is joint work with my colleague Arjun, my advisors Heather and Ben. To start this talk, I'm mean, showing you this, this chart. On the, on the left are some defenses in ML security. On the right are the time it takes for these defenses to be broken by a later stronger attack. Right, we all know this, that defense in ML security, at least, doesn't last for a very long time. They're quickly broken by strong adaptive adversaries. What we do need to keep working on defense, don't get me wrong, but boy, we sure ask a lot out of these defense. We ask them more or less to be perfect against everything in the future, but in reality and in general security as well, defenses are not meant to be perfect, right? It would be great to have a perfect defense, but defense are just meant to raise the bar of attacks, raise their cost, so at least we can stop the common attacker from breaking our system. Now, what about those extremely powerful attackers? Right, the attacker that has tons of incentives and expertise and resources, you know that they're gonna eventually win against your defense at some point with a pretty high probability. So for these type of attackers, it seems that we need something that go beyond just runtime defenses to prevent these type of attacks. And fortunately, we do have other tools in our box. And digital forensics is one of such tools that can handle the case where defense have fell and attacks are successful. So what is digital forensics? As we said, digital forensics happen after attack has already break your defense and potentially cause damages to your, to your victim system. Forensics come after attack, post attack, want to take a look at the attack retrospectively, look at the attack incident, and as well as any traces left by the attacker. And the goal is to trace back as much as possible through the system, right? Try to pinpoint who is the attacker that break your system, what type of resources being used, what type of exploits being used, right? Some examples, for example, are some set of IP address used, their bank account used to launch the attack, and in some case, we can even find the physical identity of the attacker. Once we have some information about these, we can mitigate against attacks like this, right? We can say, do things like blacklisting IP address, closed bank accounts, and in the case where we have sufficient evidence, we can even leverage legal forces to prosecute the attacker and stop attacks from this powerful attacker in the future. More importantly, perhaps, forensics can also serve as a deterrent. Right, the presence of a powerful, strong forensic system may be able to deter attack before it even happen, right? Because there's an added risk for attacker to be held responsible for their action, even if they're successful at penetrating the system and cause the damage. Forensic has a lot more benefit than what I can list on this slide. Uh, but let's take a look at how we can leverage some of the digital forensics concept for machine learning security problems that we're facing today. And as an initial step, we took a look at data poisoning attack. A quick refresher on data poisoning attack. Uh, you are training a classifier, collecting a data set. Attacker somehow got into your training data collection pipeline, injects some poison data. Now your model has a vulnerability because of these poison data. At test time, they can exploit this vulnerability and cause a misclassification. Right, very standard data poisoning attack scenario. Now, forensics come after everything has already happened here. We seek to analyze this misclassification event, as we call, and to see what went wrong, right? Who is the attacker that tried to, now try to already broken my system and break my defense and cause the damage? In the case of poison attack, that's easy to answer. It's a set of poison data that are responsible for this misclassification. So the goal is, if we can trace back, identify the set of poison data with sufficient accuracy, so we can identify how these poison data got into the system, right? Through some traditional security means like, oh, they got into because a malicious data provider or because uh, you have an unpatched vulnerability of your server, so they compromise your, your training data pipeline. I want to emphasize that this is different from poison defenses. Again, defense try to prevent the attack before it even happens, but forensics try to handle the post-mortem analysis of already happened attack. Right, to analyze who is the attacker, what went wrong, how can we prevent it in the future. So how does this work? It may seem straightforward, right? All we need to do is to analyze, go from this attack to the model parameters that are malicious and look at the training data that impact these model parameters. But this is actually pretty hard to do, mostly because deep neural networks, as we know, 
are very hard to interpret, very hard to understand. It's, it's hard for us to say anything deterministic about how training data impact the model parameters and how the millions and billions of parameters impact the misclassification. Adding on top of that, for most of the cases, poisoning is also a group effort. Right? That means we must find a sufficient amount of poison data before we can reason about whether this set of poison data cause the misclassification, right? Because most of the time, they need to work together to do this. So motivated by these two uh, challenges, we design our approach in the following way. At a very high level, we first seek to cluster the training data into groups so we can reason about them at a group level. So we seek to iteratively identify the benign clusters, where right? the cluster on, of data that are not responsible for this attack. We're going to remove these clusters until we're left with a set of poison data that are responsible. I'm going to show you a high-level overview of the end-to-end -end how the system works, and then I will talk to talk about how the individual component in the system work. So we start with all the training data, and the task here is to identify the set of poison data that caused this misclassification. Of course, we don't know uh, where are they at the beginning. First step is clustering. We group together similar types of data with each other using a certain embedding space. So we're gonna do a binary search through these clusters. We use k-min here to take a binary cut, separate data into two partitions, so separate all training data into two partitions. And we use a second component to identify which cluster is benign. And in this case, this part is benign. We keep going with the binary search, another binary cut for the rest of the data, find this is benign, keep going until we can no longer find any benign clusters. And then we know the rest data must be poisoned, so we output these data as the data flag by our system. I hope this end-to-end -end, uh, uh, illustration is clear. Now we need to talk about the two components that make this work. First is data clustering, and second is how to identify the benign clusters. Start with data clustering. The idea is simple. We just need to project the data into an embedding space to group similar types of data together. And for this work, we, we do this by using, for each training data point, by using its impact on the model parameter during the printing process as the embedding, right? For, for poison and, and benign, they have very different objectives during the training process. So they oftentimes have very different uh, embedding space, so we can group them into separate groups. Unfortunately, I really don't have time in this talk to talk about the exact embedding we used, as well as its robustness to potential adaptive adversaries. But those are covered in the paper, so take a look if you're interested. Now the focus of the rest of this talk is gonna be on the second component. Right, how do we identify the benign cluster? For example, we want to understand how does cluster B here impact the misclassification? Does it cause it? So we're going to do this counterfactually. It means we're going to remove cluster B completely out of the equation. We're going to remove it from the training data set and train a new model from scratch on the rest of the data except cluster B. And we're going to check to see whether the misclassification, the original attack, is still successful on this new model. We can do this because, again, this is forensics. After attack, so we do have access to the original attack. We can replay it. And in this case, the attack is still successful. So we know that cluster B must be benign data because removing it does not decrease the success of attack. If we do this to cluster A, you can imagine the opposite is going to happen. Where a new model trained on cluster B, the attack no longer works on it, so we know that the, uh, the poison data must be in cluster A. All right, so this indeed gave us a way to, to find the benign clusters, but as you may have already noticed, this is a very expensive to do, mostly because we have to train tons of models from scratch, and it will take around a month to do this for an ImageNet data set. So we try to speed this up using a trick called unlearning. Okay, so rather than training a new model from scratch on the rest of the training data, what we're gonna do is we're gonna unlearn or remove the, effect, the training effect of the current cluster from the original model that we have access to. And this will speed things up. And unlearning, of course, is explored in the privacy setting. A lot of proposals already exist. But unfortunately, they're still too expensive for our purpose, simply because they're not designed for this task, right? the task of unlearning a large amount of training data again and again. As a result, we propose our own version of unlearning. We call it functional un unlearning. The idea is this, right? A normal model training, you start with 
a poor model, or a randomly initialized model, you slowly, slowly convert to a local optima. Functional learning simply revert that process. We start with a good original model. We wanted to perform poorly on the data you want to unlearn, right? I want to forget because you didn't learn anything from the data set. So how do we do this? So we're going to retrain the original model so that it outputs not the correct label for each of these data you want to unlearn, but rather a uniform probability vector. So what is this? It's simply the case where the model is unsure which class or which output class this current data belong to. So you just simply give equal probability to all classes. Right, so we do this by simply minimizing this loss function to force the, the original model to output the uniform probability vector for each of the data points you want to unlearn. And this effectively turned a learning problem into a simple fine-tuning heuristic that's very efficient. So we can effectively reduce the cost of, of doing end-to-end -end forensics for ImageNet data set from one month to around two hours. Right, so this is all about uh, the two components. Uh, of course, there are more details in the paper. But let's take a look at the evaluation results. I'm going to be running behind time, so I'm going to speed this up a little bit. More results are in the paper, of course. We tested against three types of backdoor attacks, including the physical backdoor attack that does not have a known defense at this moment. We, to evaluate our system, we use the simple precision recall of the uh, poison data we identified when compared to the ground truth poison data. And it performed really well on backdoor attacks. We can achieve 97, above 97% on precision and recall at tracing back these uh, poison data. We took one step further. We took a look at clean label poison attack. Where for people who are not familiar, it's a very different threat model. It also relies on very different attack methodology. The same traceback system still work really well in this case, including against a, a, a attack with no known defense. Lastly, in the paper, we also took a look at adaptive adversaries, where attackers really try to go out their way, customize the data poisoning approach in order to bypass our forensic system. And we show that they are not effective. All right, I'll conclude my talk by pointing you to our project webpage, which includes updated version of the paper as well as a co-release. And lastly, I hope this talk was able to convince you that forensics perhaps is an interesting direction for ML security. And we do have upcoming paper at CCS in November that explore the forensics for adversary examples. The archive version is already online. You can also check out that paper. All right, I'll stop right here. Happy to take any questions.